Hello and welcome to the OIS podcast, bringing you the latest in science and tech from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. My name is Lucy Dickey, and for this episode of the OIS podcast, I speak to marine science students Michael Izumiyama and Billy Moore. They're in their first year of their PhDs and have just returned from a two week research expedition to New Caledonia. We talked about their research, their favourite dive sites, and when they first became interested in the ocean. First up is Michael. I've been interested in the ocean probably since I can remember. I used to live, when I was younger, I lived in Japan for a little bit next to this fishing port, and we have this fish processing plant that used to carry all their loads in, and that's when I first just started staring at fishes and things like that, and that was when I was really young, maybe kindergarten or so. Have you always wanted to work with tropical marine ecosystems? In the beginning, I didn't want to work in tropic, actually. That was kind of funny, but just because the environment that I grew up in, we, we didn't have tropical reefs, and I loved what it was, and I felt like a lot of people studied tropical reefs, so I wanted to study something that was local, that I was really familiar with. But once I started getting more opportunities to dive in these tropical reefs, I just realized how beautiful they are, the biodiversity, the water temp's really warm, so you don't have to wear thick wetsuits, things like that, so they've just captured my attention. I've loved them so far. Cool. And why did you decide to come to Oist? I mean, Okinawa is right next to the ocean. Oist is right next to the ocean. I remember the first week I came here, all I did was swim because <laughs> it's right there. So it's, it's in a great location with beautiful reefs and a lot of great fish and great opportunities. And so now onto what you're going to be researching for your PhD. Uh, what are you looking at over the next few years? So the main focus of my project is actually looking at these CO2 seeps in tropical reefs where um, from uh, volcanic seeps, carbon dioxide is getting released into the water and that causes an acidic environment that's similar to something, a future predicted oceans with this um, ocean acidification. So what I'm looking at is how fishes that, those reefs actually do have fishes and coral growing in them just like a healthy reef, but the the water itself is acidic, so I'm looking at how fishes adapt to this future condition, this of um, ocean acidification, and seeing if there's any population structure differences or how do they actually adapt to it. So you're kind of like looking into the future. Of Basically, Crocodiles. yeah, cool. Yeah. So, what's the coolest experience you've had whilst diving? Hmm, that's hard. I think. One of my favorite reefs that I have actually dove in, I was helping out a, a friend who was doing some um, a s- fellowship at the Riku University in Okinawa. They were actually at the Iriomote, um Marine Station, and that was probably one of the most beautiful reefs I've ever dove. There was lots of shark, uh, sea snakes everywhere, which was really cool. Um, I, I mean, that was one of the first times I've ever seen so many sea snakes, and I thought it was kind of cool just diving with sea snakes. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, so are you particularly interested in sea snakes or was it just like a new experience? Just a new experience. I'd ne- you know, you were, because I didn't come from driving, diving in a lot of tropical reefs, everything was kind of new when I was diving out there. And then I just saw, I don't know, probably 10, 20 sea snakes, which at first kind of, you know, spooked me just because I was like, oh, I'm not used to this many snakes in the water. Not, not even on land, right? So it was really cool, but. And what's your favorite kind of marine creature? Ooh, I mean, I love fishes in general. It would be hard to pick one fish, but if it was like the family of fishes, I think flat fishes, like um, soles and um, halibut and things like that, that would be my favorite family of fishes. Why is that? They're just so cool. Um, when, I was, I, when I used to fish a lot, that was one of the target fishes that I loved catching, and I just think it's really cool how when they develop, they have eyes on both sides of their head, but as they grow, it switches on to the other side. That's just something that always fascinated me. You've just returned from a research expedition, which sounds amazing. Uh, could you talk for a little bit about where you went? Definitely went to um, New Caledonia, which is a small island near New Zealand, a little off New Zealand. It's a French territory, so everybody speaks French there, which was really cool. Um, and we were in this little place called Boraca, which is a... It's about an hour from the airport, the main airport in Noumea. Um, it's a cool site where there's a mangrove forest and what happens is usually in mangrove forests, it's just a silty bottom, but there's actually a coral reef that's 
right inside that mangrove forest. And what happens at low tide when the water comes out, because of the um, soil composition, the water that's left in the forest actually gets acidified and then pulls into the coral reef. So that reef itself gets subjected to this slow acidic situation twice a day, and it's every day. So it's a really cool, really interesting site that we do research in. Yeah, and what were you specifically looking at? In that reef, it's a healthy reef, and what's really interesting is in that reef, there's actually fishes that are present outside the reef, just you know a few hundred meters away in these healthy, regular coral reefs in the open water. There's the same species of fish inhabit inside that mangrove forest where there's low, they're subjected to low acidic um, conditions, and then also that exact same species lives outside. So we wanted to see what the differences were between fishes inside the reef, or we call it the future site, and then outside in the control, which is the present site. And have you seen, did you see any differences while you were there? So the structure of the reef itself is a little bit different. The corals, um, there's a lot of the corals you see outside are also in there, but they're a little bit more different. Some of the corals are a little bit more brittle, but that might be due to either acidity or just the current flow and things like that. But in terms of the fish in there, you see a lot of fishes that you see outside, which is really amazing. And it's not just one or two fishes. There's a ton of them, just a healthy reef inside the, that really cool space. That sounds really cool. How long was the expedition for? So our expedition was scheduled for two weeks. Um, and then what happened was the last few days got cut short because of a cyclone that came in. So with that, we did get to go into town and kind of experience the city life also, which was nice too. Yeah, so you got like a good balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And could you describe what a regular day looks like while you're on the expedition? Definitely. So we'd wake up around 5, 36 o'clock in the morning. And this is all depends on the tide. So the tide does switch from day to day. But usually it'd be like 5, 36 in the morning, have a little breakfast and then drive to our site where the research vessel comes out with a small boat to pick us up to take us to the main research boat. Then we'd suit up, get ready, get our gears ready, and go out to the mangrove site, which, depending on the tide, we want to get there at low tide. Um, two hours before low tide is actually when the pH swings to about two hours after. But what happens is when the um, tide goes out and it's low tide, you can't get in because access just becomes blocked with the coral reef popping up. So we'd get there around maybe seven, eight, nine o'clock, do our work for about two to four hours, and then wait for the tide to come back up, go back out to the boat, have lunch, and do the same thing again. And did you find anything unexpected in your trip at all? In terms of in the reef, I was surprised when I saw these apex predators come to the mouth of the lagoon site. So you had like these trevallis that are large fish that are chasing all these little fish into the mouth and things like that. That was really cool. Also, it seemed like a lot of the, the... This huge problem with fishes is that fishes do get spooked when people are... There's strong hunting pressures on them. So outside in the regular reefs where people actually do some spearfishing and things like that. As soon as you go in, any big fish will hide from you. But inside this lagoon site, because it's well protected, people don't really go in there. These fish are just... There's some large fish just staring at you looking at you like oh wow what are you doing here kind of thing so it was really it was really nice seeing that environment with a healthy ecosystem in there too yeah quite a unique experience i suspect definitely yeah. and so what's next for your phd project so right now there's not much field work that we could do but the plan is um, there's two locations in okinawa in japan itself there's one in okinawa it's io torijima which is you have to go by boat, and it's a small island that they used to mine sulfur out of. And there's a CO2 vent in that island, which um, has a similar reef with CO2 bubbling into it. And then also there's another one in um, the Shinke Islands, which would be another site that we'll try to do within Japan. And hopefully if we can, our goal is to go back to the New Caledonia site, and also Papua New Guinea has a similar site with CO2 seeps. So my goal is to look at three to four sites that have these CO2 seeps and look at the population structures of those fish. What's your favorite place in Okinawa to dive? To dive? Actually, I haven't done a lot of diving on the main island. Mm -hmm. I've done it a little bit in the past in Idiomete Island, which okay. is um, a really cool place. If you ever get to go there, it's beautiful. Um, so that island, I've dove a little bit more than here. 
but for here, it's I've just snorkeled around and it's been really pretty. Yeah, and I've, the coral reefs are like yeah, shallow. really shallow enough. Um, I did go out to like the local spots here, like Apogama, which is really cool. Um, right now, you can hear the whales, which is awesome. Oh, Even snorkeling, yeah. if you just go down a little deeper and you hear the reflection of off the drop offs, you'll hear the whales like kind of like like humming and calling out. So it's really fun. It's really yeah. Fun. Yeah. Do you think you'll get the chance to go diving more? Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I think it was just when I first started here, I, I didn't have enough time to do it. Yeah. So I'll be doing a lot of Oslo diving for my research on here. That's another project that I'm doing. We're looking at um, population structures of clownfish and anemone fish. What would you say to anyone who mm -hmm. was thinking about doing marine science? Like, did you, would you have any advice for them? I mean, if you love the ocean, if you love... So if as for me, when I like first started school, I, I wasn't a big fan of, you know, like school work and the traditional way things were taught. And I think that's because I just wasn't passionate about it. So for people who want to study marine science, if you're passionate about it, then you it's not a chore anymore. For me, it's not a chore to read these um, papers. It's not a chore for me to write these you know reports and papers and things like that, because it's just something I'm really passionate about and I care about. So it just makes life a lot easier. And if that's what you're doing for your work, I think. I feel like if you love it, then you should give it a try. Next, I spoke to Billy Moore. Billy's from the UK, but was drawn to marine science through an internship at the University of Western Australia. He's especially interested in how climate change will impact coral reef ecosystems. I completed um, an internship in Australia during my undergraduate degree, and this is where it was kind of... Even though I was already undertaking a marine biology degree, this was where I really became kind of thinking, I'm definitely going to pursue a career in this. What did you do your internship in? Um, so I worked at UWA and it was kind of a similar topic to what I study now. It was essentially looking at the effects of ocean acidification on corals and coralline algae. So similar to this trip I've been on recently, we went to a certain field site that has extreme conditions. And what we did was kind of investigate whether corals and coralline algae in these extreme conditions are able to survive in the future and how are they surviving in these extreme conditions. So that was kind of really what set me on this track of climate change studies and coral reefs. Why did you decide to come to Okinawa and uh, So, well, being from the UK, the Whilst the oceans are nice and the areas around are nice, there's not a lot in terms of coral reefs because it's not a tropical area. So getting the chance to come to Okinawa where there are literally coral reefs on your doorstep, essentially surrounding the place where you live, it makes conducting the research a lot easier. So yeah, this was one of the main reasons for me in terms of wanting to pursue coral reef research and this environmental change research having coral reefs essentially on your doorstep and being able to access them and conduct research very close to home was one thing. But yeah, then also the draw of oyster was a very nice thing for me. So the kind of opportunity to design which classes I take and have a bit of input into the project I complete. So that was a big draw for me as well. Yeah, it must be really nice to be able to like walk out of the uni and into your field sites yeah. <laughs> straight away. Yeah, essentially, like, people that I speak to here at Oyster go in snorkeling and diving, you know, recreationally around Okinawa. And whilst I do that as well with my friends, that is essentially a part of my job, kind of. So, yeah, it's very nice to be able to do that so easily here, yeah. rather than having to undertake these large field trips, which are good, but they can also be expensive, hard to plan. So being able to just go to reefs around in Okinawa make conducting field work very easy. Yeah. Do you have an idea of what you're going to be researching over the next few years as part of your PhD? So I have a rough idea currently. So at the moment I'm in my first year and that means I'm completing rotations between different lab groups. But at the moment I'm in the lab of Professor Ravasi. So this is a marine climate change unit. And this is the group I've just essentially completed my rotation with. And it seems like I'm probably pretty much definitely going to be joining this lab. And the likely area of research within this um, unit that I'll be studying is kind of looking at things like I've done in the past, so the effects of environmental change, particularly over warming, so maybe heat waves or acidification on coral reef organisms. So this is in the marine climate change unit, this is particularly focused on coral reef fish and how they respond to either 
increased frequency of heat waves or perhaps acidification. So, yeah, this is likely what I will be, st be studying. But it's still not completely defined yet, so it's nice that I have the chance to sit down with Professor Ravasi and discuss this is what I want to do, you know, this sort of process, which is very nice at least. And I bet it was, must have been an amazing opportunity to find out that you were going on this research trip down to New Caledonia when you were still in your first year. Yeah, it was um, very unexpected actually. So completing these rotations, obviously, we're told we undertake a, quite a short research project that we do for a few months. So when I spoke to Professor Ravasi and he said, there's the opportunity to come to New Caledonia with us, you know, learn a lot of new techniques, which can be very beneficial, work with a lot of scientists from around the world, which is quite a unique experience. And then, you know, collect some data, bring it back and this will be the basis of your rotation. It was kind of um, unexpected, but yeah, it was a great opportunity for me to actually go out there and get some hands-on practical experience and kind of um, get more experience doing the sort of research that I would do for my actual PhD. You know? So if I join his lab, the sort of field work we did in New Caledonia is what I will continue to do for the next you know, four or five years. So yeah, it was very nice. It was a very good trip. And with this uh, two week trip, could you sort of describe what one day looked like? Like if you had a favorite day yeah. whilst you were on the trip, what was it like? What did you do? Um, so most days we would, we stayed at a kind of campground that was off of the research cruise, off of the research ship, sorry. And what we would do, we would um, wake up, essentially go to a small boat and dock where we would then be transported to the research ship. Once we got onto the ship, we would kind of make a rough plan of what we were going to do in terms of when we were there, we had two sites we visited or three sites. So we had um, control sites, which were normal conditions that are found throughout the world. And we would have uh, a future site. So this site had conditions that were representative of the future under climate change. So this included uh, lower pH, higher temperatures and lower oxygen concentrations. So we would make a plan to, in the morning, we visit the future site and we collect some fish. In the afternoon, we would visit the control site and collect some fish. So we would essentially prepare this plan. We would then kind of prepare all of the gear load all of the gear that we need for sampling, diving, snorkeling, etc. onto the boat. We would then travel to the site, and when we were at this site, there would be people diving in the water, collecting fish. Then there would be people snorkeling that would transport the fish that were collected to the boat. There were then people on the boat that were dissecting. So this involved extracting the brain, liver, gills from these fish, storing them in, well, storing them for later analysis, basically. So yeah, so we would go to the, travel to the site, um, do this and essentially come back and repeat again in the afternoon. So this is what most days looks like and in the evening we would have dinner before returning to our campground. So in terms of a favourite day I would... the days were quite similar but that's not a bad thing in the fact that we were diving and snorkeling on these nice reef environments so for me every day was very nice and every day I was learning you know new skills I'm going to use in the future so yeah that's what a normal day kind of looked like but I wouldn't say there was a specific day that stands out all, over all of the others perhaps at the start of the trip we were these were kind of exploratory days is what we call them so we were trying to identify what fish species are there and kind of just exploring the reef essentially so this was quite a, a more relaxed introduction into the trip but these days were quite nice to actually firstly see the reefs that we're going to be exploring so yeah were there any challenges in your trip when anything unexpected happened um whenever you can complete marine field work there's always challenges because you're kind of at the mercy of you know the weather um the tides also we were part of a large research cruise so maybe 20 people all from different universities so everybody is conducting their own work so these things will bring challenges so there's always these challenges within marine field work and yeah we certainly kind of encountered some so at the future site, so this was the site that we were really interested in that had the extreme conditions. Um, these conditions were created by the tides. So at low tide is when you find the really extreme low pH conditions, high temperature conditions. And this is a good thing because this is how we obviously study this site and that's what creates these conditions. But the problem is trying to get a boat into a low tide coral reef when the water depth is, you know, less than a metre 
is tricky. So, well, it's not tricky, it's pretty much impossible. So there were some days when we couldn't visit this site. So we had planned to go to the future site and the control site every day. But because of the tides towards the end of the trip, we had to cut this short essentially, which wasn't a problem because we still got all of the samples we needed, but it would have been nice to have a little bit more time there. And also when we were there towards the end of the trip, there was a tropical cyclone, which you can't really plan for. So because it was a long trip, so altogether it was two weeks. So right at the start of the trip, we didn't know that this cyclone was going to hit. You know, when it was planning, we had no idea. And um, this made us cut short our time on the research cruise by maybe it was, we had to leave two days early or something, which again, wasn't a problem because we already had our samples that we needed. But yeah, so things like this are kind of expected and challenging, but you deal with them and kind of adapt yeah, essentially. Definitely. Yeah. And did you see anything really cool while you were out snorkeling and diving? Were there any really um, cool fish or corals that really yeah. stood out? So the entire future site actually was a really cool thing to see because as I mentioned, the conditions there are really extreme and harsh. It's a harsh environment. So to see any corals there, let alone the kind of extensive um, formations that we've seen and the uh, diversity of corals. So to see this itself and the fish there was very interesting to me. But in terms of just general cool marine organisms, when we were at the control site, we seen, we saw, sorry, I think I saw a turtle and I also see, saw a couple of uh, sharks, so like black tip reef sharks. So this was really cool for me to see. It was, yeah, very interesting to me. Yeah, that's and there awesome. was there were a lot as well. It wasn't just one. I seen multiple of these black tip sharks, so it was very nice. <laughs> not afraid of sharks, then? No, not not afraid of sharks. Okay. But when you see them out of the corner of your eye at first, it, you you look twice. Yeah. <laughs> but then once you realise it's a, a kind of harmless reef shark, you're okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have a favourite dive site around Okinawa? There are, yeah, there are a lot of amazing sites around Okinawa, so since I've been here, I've visited a couple. I like to snorkel at a site called Apogama. This is quite close to um, Oist. It's about a 10 minutes away, and this is a very nice reef where there's diversity of fish, diversity of corals, and it's quite easy to access, quite easy just to walk down there with your snorkeling gear and jump in the water with a friend and have a look around. So this is one of my, um, yeah, one of my favorite sites, but there's also one I investigated the other day, dive in, it's called um, Gorilla Chop. So it has quite a strange name, it's due to a rock formation basically at this site. But yeah, I, I dove there and it was um, an interesting site as well, actually. It was, there were some interesting things to see, like coral fish, cuttlefish, turtle. So. What's the best part about doing a PhD in marine science? Mm, there are, yeah, there are multiple things that I enjoy about it, but obviously the the field work and trips like the one to New Caledonia are um, pretty u unique to marine science almost, and perhaps some other fields do these sort of trips. But yeah, I think for me, being able to conduct this field work and then come back and see the data and analyse the data is very interesting to me. And finally, um, what's your dream job? What does it look like post oyster? Mm -hmm. Post oyster, so kind of what I'm doing right now, essentially. So when you're a PhD student, you essentially do the same thing as you maybe do at postdoc level or maybe not professor level, but the idea is still the same. You know, you identify an area that you want to research, you come up with a plan of how you're going to research it, you then go out and do the field work, collect the data, analyze the data, etc. So, yeah, I think just kind of carrying on down the academic track where you perhaps go into a postdoc position and then go into a more senior research position and then into a professor professorship position that yeah that's the sort of thing I would like to do at the moment because yeah it seems very interesting to me yeah, yeah. Awesome. awesome well thank you for chatting with me thank you very much for having me <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to the podcast it was recorded and edited by me Lucy Dickey Thanks especially to Michael Izumiyama, Billy Moore and the rest of the team at the Marine Climate Change Unit. If you enjoyed the episode, subscribe to get more as soon as we release them. See you next time.